Welcome to the second episode of the Blue Cradle Dialogues. This week, I'm hosting Ambassador Peter Thompson, who's the UN Special Envoy for the Ocean, and we talk about Sustainable Development Goal 14, the law of the sea, ocean governance, sustainable fishing, and some of the key targets inside SDG 14. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this episode. I felt it was really useful because we checked in on some of the key events that are coming up uh, on the international agenda. And also just to give a sense of how uh, these dialogues are going to continue, covering the full spectrum of marine science, policy and conservation. So I hope you enjoy it and tune in in the next few weeks for the next one. Welcome to this uh, second episode of the Blue Cradle Dialogues. My name is James Nicotine, and today I'm hosting uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson, um, who is the UN uh, Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean. Um, good morning, Peter. Morning, James. Kia ora. Kia ora. How are you today? Not too bad. Uh, nice sunny day in London for a change. How have you been? Has London been, um, uh, you know, uh, Unlocking a, a little bit. Is it a lot easier now to move around or is it still locked down? Yeah, uh, May 17th is our big day when things really free up and you'll be able to go to the pub again. <laughs> um, and <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of coming out of my bunker at the end of this month. Uh, I've got to go to New York for a um, this high level thematic debate that the President General Assembly is holding on 1st of June. And then I got to be in uh, Lisbon the following week for the, um, there's a high level meeting there that the Europeans are having, uh, Portugal's president of the EU at the moment. And also to, you know, begin preparations for the UN Ocean Conference, which as you know, is being uh, held next year. So uh, I'm coming out of my bunker, uh, hopefully I don't have to go back into it uh, anytime soon. That's fantastic, because of course last year, the 2020 was the super year of the ocean, and now we're like uh, postponing a lot of these events, and now we're sort of hopefully uh, uh, realizing that super year for the ocean. So, so that's sort of part of your role is to really be the the UN person for the ocean. Can you tell us a little bit about your role in that in that role? Sure, um, I was appointed. Uh, basically to uh, push the implementation of SDG 14. I think uh, it's well known that um, there was a bit of a struggle getting SDG 14 into the 2030 agenda and having got it there, uh, you know, those of us who are passionate about it, and that's, you know, a lot of coastal states, especially small island developing states, wanted to make sure that its 10 targets were being implemented. So the Secretary General appointed me as his special envoy and uh, I go around the world uh, or speak to the world nowadays um, uh, to ensure that there's integrity of implementation going on. And um, uh, I'll take this through to, as I say, to the UN Ocean Conference, which is uh, middle of next year in Portugal. So COVID uh, has changed considerably the landscape, you think? Has it really uh, slowed down ocean protection and processes? at the UN level, but also, uh, you know, at a national level uh, around the world? Well, I think COVID, uh, excuse me, there's a rubbish truck coming up, <laughs> reversing right in front of me here, loading up our rubbish. If you get any background noise, don't worry too much about it. Hey, um, I think COVID um, pluses and minuses as far as the environment's concerned. You know, um, I think people can see the overt signs of ecosystem uh, respite, let's put it that way, you know, with the wild animals which are appearing in, in urban environments, that sort of thing. And uh, I think the general feeling is, well, wow, nature's been given a bit of a break here, but I would personally, I'm not too sanguine about that. You know, I, um, I think that uh, as countries recover from economic hardship, you know, if you think of uh, small island developing states and touristries, there's going to be a lot of pressure on them to be, uh, to go to their natural resources for, you know, earning foreign exchange. And uh, fishing, for one thing, might be uh, much more heavily relied upon. So I, I'm feeling fairly balanced about it. 
I do believe that we can, if everybody gets involved, uh, ensure that the negative consequences we come out of the pandemic can be avoided and that we can go on a blue-green recovery path rather than on that over-exploitation path, which I just warned about there. Yeah, I think it's about reinventing uh, ourselves in the, in especially the finance aspect of it. Um, you know, you, you mentioned island communities who, who who depend heavily on tourism, um, and, and so they, they've essentially had their lifelines cut off. Um, so, so in terms of the the rebuild, you like the SDG fourteen you talked about earlier. Can you just run us through the the bullet points of what SDG fourteen is actually seeking to achieve? Is it uh, sustainable fisheries and restoration and all, all of the above. So, yeah, the, I guess when you're at the UN, you talk in acronyms, but SDG, of course, is Sustainable Development Goal 14. And it is the goal to conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources. So this is where the whole uh, sustainable blue economy idea came out of this um, that uh, directive to sustainably use the ocean's resources. Uh, and let's remember that these sustainable development goals were agreed to by all leaders of the governments of this planet. Uh, it was a universal agreement uh, the, in 2015 at the United Nations. So this SDG 14 carries a huge amount of weight. Uh, there's 10 targets within it. You know, they cover... Um, better management of coastal ecosystems, uh, curbing uh, marine pollution, uh, addressing overfishing, illegal fishing, harmful fishing practices, uh, trying to counter ocean acidification, uh, which is, as you know, going on, getting rid of harmful fisheries subsidies, you know, there's $24 billion worth of public money is being spent on harmful fisheries subsidies at the moment. Uh, marine protected areas, uh, growing those under the under SDG 14 to 10% uh, of the ocean. We can talk about that a bit more because we're feeling more ambitious about that now. Uh, then there's the scientific aspects uh, and uh, there's the legal aspects, you know, support for unclass special uh, recognition of the problems of uh, small island developing states and least developed countries helping their, uh, them and their, their um, artisanal fishers get to market and uh, receive a greater share of benefits. Uh, so it's, it's a very broad um, approach to ocean health, but it's all aimed at that uh, overarching goal of conservation and sustainable use of the ocean. Which is article, yeah, yeah, article one nine two of uh, and one nine three essentially of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the the responsibility of states to uh, protect the environment in their EEZ, the exclusive economic zone, but also to be able to sustainably use the resources in those uh, exclusive economic zones. So, so is there such a thing as sustainable fishing? <laughs> sustainable fishing is possible in this day and age. Yeah, actually, before I answer that question, uh, it's not many people mention 192 and 193 of UNCLOS. I'm very glad you mentioned that. You know, <laughs> anybody who's got a pen in, uh, pen in uh, their hand, just write down 192, 193. I think that's the right number. I think 194 says something about it as well. Yeah. <clears throat> of UNCLOS, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. Just write it down and then have a look at that. Because you'll see in there that uh, we all agreed to... Um, great responsibilities when it comes to the health of the ocean and the, and the environment of the ocean. And uh, people just tend to think about what they can get out of the ocean, but we've got responsibilities as states. Except states, to, uh, yeah, ex yeah, except the ones who haven't ratified it or, or signed, you know, signed it, like the yeah, US, for uh, example. Yeah. Sure, but the good news is that they follow UNCLOS in practice. That's uh, right. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, customary um, law. Um, but for, yeah, I mean, for me, it's like the, the, the fundamental question is there are a lot of people out there who believe that, you know, fishing is is overfished. I mean, it's, it's you know, with like overfishing the oceans, they're depleted uh, and, and, and we're trying to work on, on the term sustainable. So what is sustainable fishing? It, is it, it's quite complex, isn't it? It's about yields. It's about um, protecting certain areas that are, are spawning areas, about specific species that are 
that are that are you know doing better than others, and so that's what the UN is doing um, through the FAO, presumably. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, sustainable fisheries uh, does it really exist? Well, my quick answer to that is uh, yes, definitely. Uh, you know, ever since we first speared a fish uh, on the first coastal expedition that our ancestors made, you know, we've been depleting. Uh, marine resources. Uh, but the good news is that they respond uh, if, if properly managed. Uh, it's a very abundant life system if the conditions are right. Uh, so is there sustainable fishing? Uh, definitely yes. Uh, the FAO's position on this, and they are the global authorities because they're made up of you know all of us uh, who are interested in fisheries. Um, the FAO's position is that management is the best form of conservation. So, of course, the key there is management. Are we, are we up to scratch in our management? My answer would be no. Why? Because there's 23, uh, let's say a third of global fish stocks are being overfished. A third. And that's obviously not a good situation. Uh, but management can correct that. And as I say, the stocks can rebound uh, and we've got good uh, scientific evidence to show that where stocks are being properly managed, they're either rebuilding or they're at stable levels. And of course, the reverse is true. Where they're not being properly managed, they're being overfished and they're being depleted and that's uh, poor management and we have to correct that. The important point here is, you know, uh, not to uh, get into a sort of RFMO, that's the um, regional fisheries management organizations that are responsible for the management, not to get into a kind of RFMO bashing mode, uh, not at all. It's the, the RFMOs are made up of member states, you know, so it comes to governments of member states to make sure that they are complying with what we've agreed to in SDG 14, and that uh, what we've agreed to in so many uh, meetings in FAO and made declarations to that extent that we will properly manage the ocean's resources. So, you know, it's, you've got to pull your government up on it. I don't exactly. know what yeah. country all our listeners are from, but uh, nobody's perfect in this regard. But at the end of the day, it's member states who are responsible for what we're talking about here, sustainable fisheries. Yeah, because like of course here we're talking about fisheries inside the exclusive economic zone, so that's probably about forty percent of the world's oceans. Um, but the 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 high seas, what what of the high seas? Because the high seas are ungoverned. Uh, are there quotas on the high seas? Are there like regulations for 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 species and and quotas and yields on the high seas, or is that yes, something? Are, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the regional fisheries management organizations cover most of the high seas, not all of the high seas, but, um, you know, for example, the tuna, the, there are some uh, uh, fisheries management organizations which are specific to certain species, such as tuna. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they have quotas. And um, the big thing is compliance with what's agreed in terms of quotas and who's uh, governing it and so on. So, um Better management. And if, if, if anybody ever says to you, uh, you know, you're powerless, not at all. You've got to speak to your government. Um, and uh, they're the ones who are required to actually implement what we're trying to do here in terms of better management. Yeah, because of course, I mean, all these, these uh, fisheries are, are the livelihoods of, of, of billions of people around the world who, who rely on it for their main protein and jobs. And, uh, and so in terms of... Yeah. 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 In terms of speed, yeah. they, they need that protein. You know, you can't just say stop eating fish. I mean, what are you going to feed them? That's right. Uh, you, you know, yeah. you can't eat air. Yeah. Um, the, the, the big point I want to make to you, though, about sustainable fisheries is that uh, you know, when people think about fisheries, they just think about wild catch. But actually, wild catch um, uh, has been a you know fairly stable on the graph for decades now. You know we're not catching uh, a lot more. In fact, I think there's a slight decline. Um, but where there's been this incredible growth in uh, in f uh, fish production is in aquaculture. 
That's right. And yeah. I know that there are aspects of aquaculture which are very unattractive. You know, the use of antibiotics and the use of uh, pollution of um, fjords and that sort of thing. Um, but this is a 60% growth in terms of um, giving us the fish protein that we need. And there are sustainable ways of doing aquaculture where you are not feeding uh, the fish with other fish. In other words, using uh, uh, algae, uh, using insect, etc. There's many other food stocks that could be used other than other fish. Uh, it's a matter of choosing the right species. You know, you don't have to be eating uh, top of the line um, predators. You you know, get further down the food chain, and people are very happy with catfish and things like that. Um, and then there's the whole aspect of non-fed aquaculture. You know, shellfish and seafood, uh, seaweed, and changing our diets. You know, I'm old enough to remember when the world had never heard of sushi unless you lived in Japan, as I did. Uh, in uh, the 70s. Uh, sushi had not been heard of in Europe or Australia or New Zealand or places like that. Uh, so, you know, we can change our diets substantially uh, uh, so that we are eating in a more eco-friendly way. Yeah, because that actually, uh, I think 60% of the, the world's seafood production now is, is from aquaculture, as, as far as I know, which includes shellfish, right. mussels, oysters, uh, shrimp, of course, uh, seaweed, you know, algae, and uh, and I think yeah, yeah, you're right. I think that, yeah, that's where we need to head. I mean, here, especially in New Zealand, there's a big push for for more more of the aquaculture sector and to boost that up, especially in the open ocean and looking at solutions there for for rapid, uh, um, uh, you know, setting up in terms of the legislation uh, of these uh, yeah of these open ocean uh, farms, um, which is taking time. Um, but I think that there's certainly, uh, I think, a bright future ahead for for that kind of uh, industry, and, and I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that that would, you know, create jobs and, and livelihoods as well, and also regenerate the ocean because a lot of these animals uh, are filter feeders, and there's a lot of benefits uh, for, for, you know, for you know, having a uh, yeah shellfish aquaculture in, a, in an ecosystem. There's also the potential for multi-trophic aquaculture and integrating different. Uh, species together I think that's really promising and uh, unfortunately climate change is there and it's really threatening these these industries and these uh, livelihoods and I think for, for me the next question just comes naturally is what is threatening the ocean the most at the moment is it, is it climate change and its impacts or is it the threat of overfishing uh, that we talked about earlier you know, for me, definitely, it's climate change. Uh, I was at a meeting of the Pacific um, Commission in New a couple of years ago and saw the presentations there on um, what ocean warming and other uh, changing uh, ecosystem influences are having on the Southwest Pacific. And the fact that uh, several of the key economic tuna species of the Southwest Pacific. And remember that, uh, you know, some of the countries like Tuvalu and so on rely on tuna catch for over 90% of their foreign exchange, that that uh, resource is going to move away by the end of this century, totally move away. It's going to go south towards New Zealand, but mostly it's going to go uh, east to the coast of Latin America. So, you know, this, this is climate change in action as well. Uh, and, you know, the whole area of ocean warming, uh, ocean acidification, deoxygenation, all comes from our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, even if we did everything right tomorrow, uh, we're going to feel the effects of that for hundreds of years. Uh, so... Uh, in terms of uh, overfishing, I think that's very fixable. And I do believe we, we will be in a very much better position on overfishing uh, by 2030 at the end of SDG 14. Uh, I think we will be in a much better shape and things like sustainable aquaculture. Uh, but the effects of climate change are much more pernicious and more uh, long term, something our grandchildren will be living with. And uh, 
we obviously, I mean, the, 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 the central message is get to Glasgow, get your government to be there and be the, amongst the most ambitious of uh, governments because all of us have to speak to our governments wherever we are in the world and say, get to Glasgow and think about our grandchildren because where we're going at the moment, it's going to be really bad for them. Yeah, so this year is the is the replacement year of the 2020 super year, you know, in a way. And we have three, I think, big meetings in the next uh, six months. We've got the IUCN Conservation Congress in September, which is also held online. We have um, a meeting in October, I believe, in China, which is the COP15, the, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity in Kunming. And then thirdly, we have COP26, the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change meeting that you just mentioned in Glasgow. Um, why, why are those three meetings so important? And, and potentially there's a fourth one as well, which, which we can cover as well is the, the Camelar meeting in, in October as well, I believe on November, which is uh, I think the 61st year of the Antarctic Treaty. And, and, and the Camelar, of course, convention is the, the convention based in Tasmania, looking at the um, management of uh, biological resources in the Southern Ocean and Antarctica. And, and, and so there's a big um, push, uh, I understand, for, for further Southern Ocean protection. And so the, those four meetings are happening uh, back to back. And so in 2022, we'll be in a, in a very different place because we'll have new, new biodiversity targets. We'll have new um, climate targets and ambitions. We'll have hopefully new Southern Ocean protected and we'll have um, a new IUCN uh, roadmap as well for the four years ahead. So can you talk, uh, talk to us a little bit about the, the diplomacy and the, and the next few months, what's going to happen and what needs to happen? Okay, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's leave Kamlar out of that and I'll answer that as a separate question. But the others... Um, Marseille, Kunming, Glasgow. Uh, I'll be at all of those. I have uh, <clears throat> uh, keynote speaking roles at all of them. And uh, oh, sorry, not at Glasgow at this stage, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm ensuring that we get in there with the ocean. Don't you worry. Uh, but anyway, my the reason I'm there at all of those, and I've been working on them now for a year or more, is that everything is connected. And for me, with my responsibility towards the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon in the middle of next year, these are key uh, milestones on the way to Lisbon. Uh, and of course, Glasgow is much more than a milestone. It's the portal to a successful uh, UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon. Uh, the first one that you mentioned, IUCN in Marseille, yes, a uh, lot of uh, focus on ocean there. I think we've got seven days of working on uh, ocean issues. Uh, and then the CBD uh, COP, uh, for your listeners, a COP is a convention of parties. So in other words, all the parties, that are, all the um, yeah, parties to the convention on biodiversity will be there. So that's all of us, uh, our member states, mostly. Um, so the big thing there for the ocean is this 30 by 30. Um, that they're, they're going to adopt in Kunming a post-2020 global biodiversity uh, framework, which is going to be a set of targets about what we want to do for the next decade uh, in, in terms of um, improving the environment. So one of the things that is very likely to be in there, and one of the reasons I'm going to be in Kunming to speak on behalf of it, is a 30 by 30 proposal, whereby 30% of the ocean um, will be protected by 2030. That's the idea there. Uh, and there's a lot of work to be done in that area. We can talk about marine protected areas if you like, James, uh, because um, we're not doing as well as we should be. Uh, and then the other one that you mentioned was uh, Glasgow, of course. So, you know, that's where, that's the turning point in history, really. Uh, we're currently on a track, and this is not me making up these figures. This comes from the World Meteorological Organization. 
uh, we're currently heading to a world within the life of my granddaughters uh, of over three degrees uh, by the end of the century. You know, this is a world on fire, and it's an obviously unacceptable future for responsible human beings alive today. So in Glasgow, it has to be at that kind of level uh, where, where people realize they're making decisions, intergenerational decisions. And all the best scientific information is that we've only got seven years to bend our uh, emissions curve. Otherwise, um, you know, it's going to be tough. So um, the point that I really want to underline, though, is that all of these going through to Lisbon are all interconnected. You, you, you know, you can't have silos in approaching biodiversity or climate or ocean. It's all one thing. And in terms of the problem, it's our GHG emission uh, problem. And getting that under control, while it's, while it's not a silver bullet, it is the one ring that rules them all and in the darkness binds them. You know, we've got to deal with that. GHG emissions or all the other good work we're doing will come to naught. So, uh, you know, you can't be strong enough on the need for Glasgow to really deliver a change of direction. So, the, I mean, the level of energy that we're consuming and, and uh, that we're going to consume at the level that we're at, if you look at the, the developing countries who want to, who, you know, they're catching up, they want to, you know, they want the flat screen TVs, they want the big cars, they just want the stuff that the Northern Hemisphere has had for so many decades and, and benefited from the industrial revolution and, and the cheap fossil fuels that we burn. And so how do we, how do we ensure that they don't go down that route of the, you know, cheap energy route and, and how do we level with the developing countries and give them the, the, you know, the renewable energy that they need, the, you know, potentially the nuclear energy that they need, the solar energy, the, I mean, it's an energy question, isn't it? If, if they go for the cheap coal, you know, cheap coal is, is easier to, to dig out than, than the expensive. All know. right. So you, you mentioned fossil fuels. You know, with, with the offshore wind alone can give us eight times the amount of energy we need to power civilization as we know it. So, you know, why are we still dealing with oil and gas? We know that we can get all that we need from offshore wind. And I'm not even bringing in tidal or uh, all the other ocean energy yeah. um, possibilities. But this is, you know, proven. And so it's just a matter of investment, right? So, yeah. of course, you know, uh, developing countries would like to have their share of that. So for me, one of the big things about being in Glasgow is to make sure that the ocean and developing countries are getting their fair share of the climate finance cake, because as you know, that's, that's it. multi, multi billion dollars. We're talking about the green climate fund, uh, global economic, uh, global environment facility and so on. Get that more into the sustainable blue economy. And we're going to be looking a lot better uh, on things like offshore energy, you know, wind energy, uh, sustainable aquaculture, uh, greening of shipping so that you don't have ships sailing along your coastline burning the filthiest kind of fuel which is bunker fuel yeah bad for your people's health you know i've been in uh, up in scandinavia and watched gigantic ferries leaving oslo and going down to germany just running entirely on electricity you know just plug in at the wharf as long as you've got a within a 24 turnaround you can do that now so coastal shipping should get away from bunker fuel as quickly as possible. And of course, that rely, that, that, uh, the kick on is that you've got to have renewable energy uh, supplying that power supply on the wharf. And that's, you know, somewhere like Fiji, where we have hydro, that's uh, very achievable. Somewhere like uh, New Zealand, where you've got plenty of wind, uh, you know, that can be coming from offshore wind. Uh, so it's, it's very doable. It's just a matter of slicing up that climate finance pie and making sure it's going into the sustainable blue economy yeah i think it's, it's really a, the 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 goal that we're all having is to be uh, carbon neutral around the world and, and and even potentially um carbon negative and i think the for, for, from what i understand a, a lot of governments are looking at uh, electric vehicles uh to replace our fleets of aging 
uh, internal combustion engine vehicles and even aviation is looking at uh, using uh, uh, you know hydrogen planes and electric planes and uh, I think EasyJet, the, the 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 European company, the short haul company, is looking at developing uh, uh, you know electric planes. So this is all happening, and I think the my yeah, my only worry is time. Is do we have enough time to transition the whole the whole world at the at the at the pace at which it's going? You know, you mentioned three degrees uh, increase in temperature. Uh, we're already at one degree. We're already at one point one, I believe. Um, if if we hit 1.5, it's 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 bye bye to corals. 99% of the corals will be gone. Um, so it's like yeah. we have enough time, and and time is of the essence. I think that's really my my. Uh, yeah. Look, James, I think the big thing here is that you know huge change in consumption and production patterns required. I mean, you mentioned the flat screens. You know, the same thing with motor cars and all the rest. Uh, but the fact is we can do with a lot less. You know, when I was living in New York, uh, I read, you know, the 10th report on the effect of beef on the uh, global ecosystem. And I said to my wife at dinner one night, you know, we we're looking at a photo of our grandchildren and said, who do we love more, our grandchildren or eating roast beef and hamburgers? I said, well, obviously the grandchildren. So from that moment on, we never touch beef again. Right, so um, you know, motor cars. I haven't owned, personally owned a motor car for decades now because I don't want to be driving around in a something that is poisoning my uh, environment. I don't want to be responsible for that. I use public transport, and uh, you know most of that. Somewhere like London, all the buses are. Uh, electric and you know that's the way we're going and anybody who's still driving around in a motor car that puts out those poisonous gases they need to think about what they're doing to their children and grandchildren's future and by the way they're probably going to end up with they've got an expensive one with a stranded asset because most governments are moving fast now towards banning uh, internal combustion engine sales uh, in you know quite soon you know, to the life of your current car and in many cases. So don't end up with a stranded asset. Get, if you must have a car, and obviously there are people that must, get an electric one. Yeah, I think it's, no, you're absolutely right. I think that's, that's the way the world is going. I think different levels of, uh, of development, of course, in different countries. But here in New Zealand, there's a very big uh, hybrid fleet and EVs are, are starting to pop up everywhere as well. And countries like Norway, are, you know, leading and, and, and Germany and, and the UK. You, you mentioned buses, though, in London, and, you know, I could not help but think um, uh, of a report that I read recently on, on primary microplastics. And a lot of people maybe don't know, but actually one of the, pro you know, main sources of primary microplastics are tires. And I was reading that uh, a, a London bus produces in one day 300 grams of primary microplastics that are washed uh, you know, on the streets, end up in the gutters, uh, probably in the sewage system, and then don't get filtered out and end up in the ocean. So primary microplastics are the invisible uh, particles that, uh, uh, you know, that make up the rubber of the, of the tires. And so uh, on average, um, yeah, 300 grams per, 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 you know, per bus. So think of, you know, the amounts of buses that are in London and all around the world and the cars that are just slowly leaking away these primary microplastics. Um, and that's just one yeah. source. So, yeah. uh, first, of all, first of all, I think it's wrong to highlight London buses. They're providing a good service. They're left <laughs> they're carrying you know, uh, thousands of people every day as opposed to tens of thousands of cars being on the road with their rubber tires, right? Correct. So correct. first of all, that. Secondly, microplastics are everywhere. You think of the paint on your house. That's acrylic paint. What happens when you uh, take that off? That, and where is that going with that, when you sand off that paint? It's all going to the ocean. Your clothes as so well. Clothes, every time you wash your clothes, uh, and if you've got stretchy clothes, it's got uh, oil-based product in it. Uh, so those microplastics have permeated the ocean. There's no doubt about that. Uh, what we don't know, and of course they're in our food chain, and we're eating them. What we don't know is what is the effect of those 
on our bodies. We know that, that microplastics cross our blood-brain barrier. We know that they cross the placental barrier. Um, I've written to the head of WHO and say, you know, we need medical science to tell us if this is okay. You know, maybe it is, but where's the research? Where's the advice? Where's the peer review? Yeah. That's going? And it's not. Obviously, we've got other things to worry about at WHO with the pandemic, but I think yeah. this is business for the 20th, uh, 21st century. We need to get on top of this because it could be doing us irreparable harm. Yeah, on that note, I mean, it's it's something that we are taking very seriously here in New Zealand. And, and one of our objectives at Blue Cradle is to uh, collect microplastics data in the, in the Hauraki Gulf, one of um, New Zealand's most populated areas, and also have a comp you know comparable data set with uh, different parts of Northland and, and Whangarei as well. So we're going to be doing some data collecting uh, with Cawthron and ESR and Algalita in the next few weeks. Um, and it's it's very it's very uh, worrying, as you say, that it's entering our our, our bodies in, in that way, and we're not sure what it's doing. And and all the endocrine um, uh, disruptors that are potentially in you know on those microplastic particles and the chemicals that are associated with them, uh, 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 yeah, ready to be um, uh, you know it should be a one of our areas of concern when you you know we're looking at what we're doing to the ocean i think that you know we talk a lot about macroplastics the, the 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 larger and of course waste management is a huge issue but i think the the microplastics the primary ones the ones that are already in their microplastic um stage uh entering directly the ocean i think they're they're underlooked i think they represent 1.5 million tons per year out of the um eight million tons per year that are already entering the the, the ocean which is really uh, so it's, it's kind of a tip of the iceberg there i think um sure. yeah james as you're talking i remembered that there was a second part to your earlier question about camla where you were That's explaining right. to, uh, viewers about camla and how it looks after the uh, environment around antarctica and uh it's made up of um, the countries that are uh, parties to that convention and New Zealand is one of them. Uh, it, it, I forget what the actual number is, but it's a, it's, a, it's a small number when you think of the 194 countries in the world who are actually members of CAMLA. So the world, in a sense, has given great responsibility to those countries to govern responsibly uh, the waters around Antarctica. Um, as you may recall, because New Zealand was involved uh, with Secretary of State Kerry, uh, we're going back, you know, four or five years now in the uh, Kamla's establishment of the Ross Sea as a marine protected area. That was, I think, the world's biggest uh, marine protected area at that stage. And, um, you know, congratulations to New Zealand and uh, State Secretary, uh, Secretary of State uh, Kerry for doing that. But since then, nada. And there are, uh, there's uh, huge opportunities there to uh, do the right thing and, and do what Kamala actually agreed to a long time ago, which was to set up a ring of marine protected areas around Antarctica. There are two giant ones in uh, the Weddell Sea and uh, East Antarctica, which have had all the necessary scientific work done. They're supported by pretty much everybody on Kamala. But for the last couple of years, we've been banging our heads on the Kamala door, trying to get these marine protected areas declared. So uh, there's a renewed effort this year. And again, you know, speak to your government. That's who goes along to these meetings. Uh, and it shouldn't just be your Ministry of Fisheries people going along and deciding how much fish they're going to take out of Antarctica. It should be your, you know, the, 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 the national positions of the countries involved. You know, and, you've, and, and all countries have signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals. And you can't have a, a depleting fisheries resources over exploitation of Antarctica waters. They have to be uh, properly, properly governed. And science says that we need these marine protected areas. So it's really work at hand for this year. So thank you for highlighting Kamla as one of the really important meetings being held this year. And New Zealand has a role to play. Yeah, I mean, I think it's because of my proximity to the, the Southern Ocean that I do uh, look at those issues quite regularly, frequently. Here in Christchurch, we have a very big uh, Antarctic community. We have Gateway Antarctica. We're one of five gateway cities 
to the to the southern continent. And I think the the Ross Sea is, is coined as one of these, you know, one of the first uh, international marine protected area, which are probably likely to be, uh, you know, more and more as as the BBNJ, the, the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction framework comes into existence. Um, the implementing agreement, which will be an addendum in a way to the to the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, what's the state of that uh, negotiation? Can you give us an update on that? Uh, the BBNJ conference, um, I think it's met uh, two or three times already. Uh, it's meeting again uh, at, towards the end of this year at the United Nations. Again, it's member state driven process. Uh, they are um, looking at uh, producing a high seas treaty, which will uh, look after uh, environmental impact assessment in, in, in the uh, high seas, uh, marine protected areas in the high seas, uh, transfer of technology, uh, especially uh, to developing countries, you know, recognizing the interconnectedness of everything and that we must properly govern the high seas if we're going to have a healthy ocean. Uh, and James, as you've heard me say many times, we can't have a healthy planet if we don't have a healthy ocean. So the importance of BBNJ is, is uh, there for all to see. Uh, the ocean's health is currently in decline. Uh, if you measure it by way of uh, acidification rates, uh, deoxygenation rates, uh, warming rates, you know, leading to rising sea levels and death of coral, overfishing, marine plastic pollution, etc. All those are scientifically measurable uh, as uh, a um, ocean in decline. And that's our job, to turn that around. And as we've discussed now, uh, that is something that is achievable, uh, turning around that decline. That's our responsibility in this generation for uh, future generations, that we fix the damage that we've done and um, get back to a relationship of respect and balance with the ocean. James, my time's up. It's been yep. great uh, talking to you. And, um, you know, I do hope that uh, we can keep this conversation going. Likewise, I think you should just mention us the, the decade that's just started, if you don't mind, the, 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 the decade of ocean science. UN ocean, yes, the UN decade uh, of ocean science for sustainable development, that's underway, as is the UN decade for ecosystem restoration. You know, so we're in a decade of action here. And, and I'd say to all your listeners, just get involved. You know, the, the ocean is, is uh, your future, your, your children's future. So get involved in this work to reverse that decline. Thank you very much, Peter. I really appreciate your time and for the ocean. Yeah, good talking to you. See Likewise. you in Lisbon. Thank you. I hope so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>